Welcome to the Couples Expert Podcast with Stuart Fensterheim, LCSW, your source for the latest tips and practical down-to-earth advice on creating emotionally connected, thriving relationships. Now, here's Stuart. Welcome back to the Couples Expert Relationship Podcast. I have Rebecca Wong, a really good friend of mine, who is one of the counselors that I met when I was at the awesome conference in La Jolla that I just got done doing a podcast about. And I have asked her to come on the podcast to talk to all of you because she has a specialization in something that I think fits so well with my audience, which is she and I both work very much in the area of connections with relationships. She has a tougher job than I do, though, because she deals with couples who are struggling with staying connected as parents. And that is an area that is so critical. And we're going to talk a lot with Rebecca about that. But I wanted to introduce her. She's out of the New York area, out of Hudson Valley. She's been in private practice for about five years. And Rebecca, one of the things that I wanted to sort of start with is to talk a little bit about how you got into the, this area and why you chose that area and working with parents and, and how it relates to you and what you do. So, so welcome, Rebecca, and thank you for joining me on the Couples Expert Podcast. Hi, Stuart. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about just maybe even more than just why the parent area, but what got you into counseling? And tell me just a little bit about your journey. Oh, boy. Loaded question to start with. <laughs> <laughs> always. We always do loaded questions. Just not with a gun. That's all. Um, oh, gosh. What got me here? Well, you know, I am a parent myself. I have two little girls and they're ages four and six. And um, life is a trip. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, they didn't get me into, into counseling. I've been, I've been working in this field for, for beyond their lifetime. Um, you mean but, the kids driving you crazy isn't why you went into counseling? No, but, but it is why I specialize in the area that I specialize in now. It's, it's been my own parenting journey that has led to a lot of research because I'm in the same soup as, as all my clients are. Mm -hmm. oh, gosh, I'd probably have to trace back to like my own early, early years if I were to, to get into, why I'm a therapist, <laughs> but um, that would I mean, be I mean, I a whole other th podcast. <laughs> yeah, possibly, but I think for at least for me, what it's really about is you know having experiences that then say you know at least sort of for me it, it has been I had a number of experiences in my life that I wish I had someone there for me. And I didn't really feel that closeness with somebody who I really could turn to and be vulnerable with. So I sort of looked at my life at one point and said, you know, I wish I had, and I'm going to be that person. So I'm sort of hearing the same thing in what you're saying. You're hearing so much of that. You know, I certainly felt like that in my life, but I did have two particular people that I, I did feel really, really connected to, and they were my mm. paternal grandparents. Um, mm. They also happened to be Holocaust survivors. And so oh, they wow. had this really interesting spin on what love and life and what connections were about, how to repair relationships, how to, how to just be resilient people. So they, they taught me something that I don't think I could have learned in any other way. And I think from what you're saying, and for me, you know, as you say that, I sort of have chills <laughs> going yeah. up and down my arms when you talk about Holocaust survivors, because when we talk about making every day count, yeah. there's nothing that sort of brings that to mind for me. And, and, you know, we can look at it globally, sort of Holocaust survivor, but we can <laughs> even look at it and bring it down a little bit in terms of the intensity and say, you never know what the next day is going to bring. Right. And, and if you don't really sort of smell the roses and, and really make it important to let people know how you feel, you may not always get that opportunity. Right. You know, one of the things that my grandmother used to say to me when I was a child was never to go to bed angry. And I don't mm -hmm. think I knew what that meant until more recent years. Um, and becoming a parent has really complicated that because uh -huh. as a parent, sometimes just getting to bed <laughs> is, a feat, is a feat in and of itself. 
So the never going to bed angry part became a really complex thing for me to understand. But as I've kind of evolved into my work and into my own life, it's become something that's really kind of central in um, who I am as a person. Yeah, and, and that whole concept is really an interesting one and because for me, the way I interpret not going to bed angry mm-hmm. is more about not going to bed resentful yes. um, as opposed to because I'm not even really sure that's a realistic goal for people. And I think sometimes it causes such conflicts for couples, especially with kids, because, you know, I have I have two daughters, one's 20 one or about to be 21 and one who just turned 18 and there have been many times that I went to bed angry because of an interaction with them but one of the things that we all really did and I I think this is a lot of what you're going to be talking about is really when we were still angry with each other number one acknowledging it but number two really we would always take at least a minute and put the anger a little bit aside and say, I am still angry with you, but I still love you more than life itself. Exactly. And then go to bed pissed (laughs) off about what happened. But the bigger picture, I think, for, for them, especially my oldest child, which really is a child that really needs to feel that stability and security about how someone feels, that my feelings for them have not changed. And that is such the message. Right. That, that is so much about what it's about. You know, there's this softening that happens when we feel connected to others. Mm-hmm. This, this receptivity, this ability to, to let them influence us, to, to hear each other. And I think for me, that's the piece. You know, the, being able to give each other a hug, even if you don't agree about something. Those are the moments for me that, that really kind of speak to the core of this, you know, that I accept you and that there is security here within our unit, within our family. We are, we are stable. Right. And through that stability, and what's really interesting about what you're saying right now, and I'm, my brain is sort of going off in a couple of other directions, because you, you and I are going to be involved in this online summit on yeah. conflict. And, and I know that one of the things that we're both talking about is how that connection really allows people to get through their conflicts and still do it in a way that's healthy and loving and respectful and really holding true to what's important, which is how we feel about each other. And even when we're angry, we can allow that to really take over And if we do that, we lose the security, and then what do we have? Right. Our connections to one another become a container for all the things Mm -hmm. we feel. And all the things we feel and our connection to one another becomes an opportunity to work through stuff and to feel more secure in life. Right. And, And what we know with some of the research studies about that security, that without that... Without that feeling of security, (laughs) the primal panic that comes up for people is why things get out of hand. And what can we do as, and this is where I'd like to sort of have you talk a little bit about, you know, when you have these issues that come up with your kids, especially, you know, where, you know, you feel totally disregarded and totally (laughs) unimportant Mm-hmm. And so you're dealing with those issues as well and sort of it's wanting your child who you brought into this world to love you more than anything. At times it appears that they can't stand even looking at your face. Mm-hmm. A- and then so you have all that churning up and then something happens, a trigger happens. So you deal with that and then you go and to be with your wife to talk about that or your husband and then feel discounted there, wow. It's so big. And I think that's the the piece. That's the reason why I'm so interested in working with parenting couples because I feel like they are this kind of central peg in helping, helping to kind of create this ripple where we grow people up who are connected and who know how to have relationships. If we can teach the parents, then they can teach their kids. They can create that environment. And the multi-generational problem that is because, you know, a lot of us 
have been raised in homes that aren't necessarily connected. Some do. I, I feel sort of fortunate that I have. And But there are a lot of people who come from very disconnected families now trying to have connected families. And, and then things stir up and then they have nothing to fall back on. Right. And, you know, it's so interesting that you bring that up because one of the things I think about a lot is that we all end up with in many ways, our perfect partner. It's, it's often unconscious, even though there are sometimes a lot of strife. It's not an accident that we're attracted to the people that we are. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, the people that we're with are just the mirror that we need to be able to see something within ourselves that maybe needs repair. And it's through that mirror, through that reflection of what, what doesn't feel right that we have an opportunity to do some healing. And often, when we do that in connection with somebody else in that relationship, then that's that's where kind of real growth happens. But yeah, it's true, but there's a big statement there. There's an if, if you trust that person. Oh, if, the trust is big. If, <laughs> if you could be vulnerable, if you yep. feel like the person really has your back, then I will hear that input and, you know, take a lot. But if yes. there's any sense of we're not really in this together – that this is another opportunity for my partner to just put me down, yep. then that is war. It is total war. Right. And so, you know, and we all come from different kind of attachment styles. And, you know, we'll be talking a lot about that over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. But what do you do then? I mean, I, I guess that's my question to you is, is yeah. you're working with this couple who really don't have that, I would assume by the time they get to you, they don't have a feeling that they're there for each other. And so giving the feedback that you just talked about, which I think is absolutely essential because I agree 100% with everything you said, that I should really allow my partner to be the mirror image, to give me those that feedback because they only care about me. So obviously the feedback is coming from a good place. But if I don't believe that, where do we go from there? Right. So we start with little moments. We don't start with that big feedback stuff. We don't start with the big reflections. We start with kind of being mindful of little moments to connect with each other. We start paying attention to where our partner does have our back. And it might not be in everything, but there might be a thing, a little place where there's a spark and we feel that they're really standing behind us. Mm -hmm. And so I start tuning my clients into those moments. That's where we start our work. The small moments. The small moments. You know, that's, that's interesting you say that because I do it all the time with couples that I see where they come in and I have one or the other saying how their partner just is never there for them, didn't even want to come here. Right. And they're here in a bad way. They didn't, you know, not in a good attitude and blah, 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 blah. And then I turn to them and I typically say, so why is he sitting here then if he doesn't think it's any good? Mm -hmm. I said, doesn't he have free choice? Isn't there a way that he could walk out the door right this second if he wanted to? I'm not going to drag him down. I'm not going to give him a tackle him here. He's sitting there, obviously, somewhat willingly. Let's pay attention to the part that is a connection, which is he's here because you matter. And That's I think you know, all the time, the couples are constantly trying to show each other that they're there. But those, those efforts don't get seen. Right. And that is our job to point those at and flash those up to couples. Yeah. I think that's especially true with parent-child stuff. If, oh, uh, so much so because it's, it's the same reason that the kids throw tantrums, no matter what age they are, whether they're two or they're 22, they're still throwing tantrums for the same reason. They want to be seen. Right. <laughs> uh, how do you see this issue playing itself out, and I'm going to change the topic a little bit on you, mm -hmm. uh, make it a little bit more complicated and harder for you, is with step parenting. When you have one biological and one non-biological parent in a family working with a child who may be having difficulties, may not, and all those issues, how does it change in terms of how you would try to get them to see that closeness and yeah, um, I'm thinking of a particular client that I work with. <laughs> okay. um, it layers things on a whole different level because oftentimes the, the initial relationship, the relationship that these children are born out of, 
there's still layers of that relationship that are interwoven into everything. And then there's this new marriage. And so the parents are trying to find their way into each other and how to integrate this family. But all this other stuff is still coming up. And I like to say that our kids are sponges and that they're reacting to the stuff they feel and that they see all the time. We all are. I think adults are too, but we just, we're less aware of our sponginess. But that's a big piece of it. So for the parents to kind of be mindful that the kids are a piece of this relationship, especially in step families, that the the relationship can't just be built around the two individuals like it probably was before they had children in their earlier relationships. In this relationship, the relationship has to be built around the family unit and the family working. And for me, part of the issue here is whether or not the two adults believe that they're in this forever. Yeah. Because there are choices. Been hurt already. Right. And they I mean, I had this dialogue with a client the other day and I said, you know, you know, we're sitting here talking about being there forever, but when you're in your sort of you get into your thirties, forties and fifties, you know, people get divorced. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not forever. So how do you really sustain that as a couple? Believing you're in this forever because some of the choices that you make, particularly when kids are involved, is where does the energy belong? Who's, you know, who do I connect to? And so, so this is not an idea that comes from like psychological theory stuff, but Stephen Covey writes about kind of beginning with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. in, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I believe this is true for families too, that when we're kind of coming together and trying to figure out what kind of family are we going to be, what kind of marriage are we going to have, I think we have to look at that from the perspective of who do we want to be? Mm -hmm. How do we want to grow? What do we want to become? And to include the children in that conversation, to kind of like sit down and have like a state of the state of the family meeting like every week and to talk about where we're going and how we want to get there and who do we want to be. That's really integral. But then it becomes, I guess the piece I'm talking about sometimes in some families, it gets to, well, you have to pick who's more important, who's less important, who, you know, whose needs get taken care of first. Some of this is a parenting discussion, which is different than what we're sort of talking about. But for the most part, I think it's the same. Because what it's really about is kids do leave. Mm -hmm. They grow up, they have their life on their own, and hopefully you have a really positive relationship. I think sometimes the question that couples struggle with is, can I really count that my partner's going to be there for me more than my child because in my opinion, at least, is if you as an adult in a, in a couple of relationship don't give to each other, believing that you're there forever, you won't be. Yeah. You're going to disconnect. Right. And, hear that. and how do you then put the priority in and how do you help couples see that what they have in that connection is, is a, it is a ripple effect as you're talking about? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with understanding each other's inner world and knowing, knowing that you have each other's back because you know that you understand each other. Mm -hmm. So in a step family, you have two parents that are coming in and whether they each have children of their own or only one does, the parents are coming in with their own children's needs in mind as well. Right. And so part of step parenting and feeling like you're in this forever is to understand the other parent's perspective. They're not just your partner. They're also a parent. And mm -hmm. so to understand kind of what those needs are, because so often what I hear from step families is the conflict arises when they feel that their partner doesn't have their back around parenting. Mm -hmm. But as an EFT therapist, my feeling is that's all symptomatic. It's all a symptom. It's all surface. It's really, and I think you're saying it, but it's really getting to the place and having the dialogue about what do we as a couple need to do so mm -hmm. we feel that you always have each other's back. Am right. I, it's, am, it's t yeah, totally. It's having that discussion about what do you need from me? What do you see in the couples that you work with that help couples really begin to see that they have each other's back? Gosh, I think sometimes they begin to see that they have each other's back 
just like even sometimes in the first session, the fact that they both show up. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> that is <know>? true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're both wanting something from this. Um, there's, and that's even in some of the most disconnected couples that I work with. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a process that I see in my work where we, we start to understand and get into kind of each other's inner worlds. And some, sometimes the work I do is very kind of individually focused in a couple's kind of setting so that the, they get to see each other. They get to really hear each other. They get to experience each other. And from there, empathy grows. And from there, they start to trust each other more because they feel understood. Right. And I think we keep talking about the same issue, which I think no matter who you, when you, when you are a couples therapist, and one of the things that I think you do so well is you really show your passion and your belief. And through your guidance and having the right dialogue and seeing how passionate you are, Rebecca, about, about this process and about what they can become, mm-hmm. they, they hopefully buy into that and then allow themselves to really see that in their partners. Yeah. And we also do a lot of work just about kind of like how to manage conflict better because Mm -hmm. so often the ways that we manage conflict are just the ways we were taught to manage conflict, the types of models that we had in terms of conflict. They go back to our attachment styles Um, and they're not necessarily what's working or even what we want to be doing. So sometimes we just make little shifts in there and that allows some other softening to happen that lets us kind of get to the heart of having our partners back in a different way to let us experience that. So I'd like to ask you, uh, take it a little bit deeper, um, Mm -hmm. but on a different level that sort of fits so well in this, which is couples intimacy. Because I know that's an area that you work a lot with. And I've sort of had the privilege to be part of that whole thing that you have going on your website and tell my listeners a little bit about what that is. Yeah, I have, I have a eight part series on reconnecting parent couples on my, on my blog. And, um, my website is connectfulness.com. And on that series that we have, um, two posts that are published right now. The third one's coming out soon. And the first one is about redefining intimacy in parent couples. Mm -hmm. And the second post is on the little moments. It's on noticing the little moments that happen every day. Right. And, and, and one of the things, just so you know, Rebecca, and I want to remind everybody that, uh, and I say it every time we do these podcasts, that on my show notes, I'm going to have Rebecca's website uh, and a link to her blog so that you can go right there and, and see, see exactly what she's talking about. So we'll have that on the show notes. But so in trying to keep that part of a relationship alive with kids involved, what are some of the lessons that you've learned through your work on how to help people to really make that important? And I, and, and before, yep. be, let me interrupt you a minute because I don't want it to sound like that's the most important thing. So we have to do that no matter what. Um, I, I don't want that message, but that being such, you know, and I think we should probably make it bigger than just sexuality. We're talking about intimacy, which is affection and all those areas. Yeah. Yeah. I, I even find that in order to make sex better, we have to make other areas of intimacy better first. And so the little moments, the stuff that I talk about, they're, they're actually really, really big, but they have to be really doable and they have to fit into our busy lives. And that's perhaps the biggest piece is that it is so hard as parents to be mindful of these, these moments to connect to our partner. So the smaller we make these moments, the more effective they become, the more we do them. Some of my favorite ones, for example, I love just helping couples to be mindful of their partings and returns. So noticing how they say good morning and good night to each other, noticing how they welcome each other home and how they say goodbye to each other when they part ways every day. Those just the awareness and the mindfulness that takes place place in paying attention to that stuff is actually a really big deal and it can totally shift a partner's um, experience of one another. Do you know what's interesting about that? I'm thinking about when I was dating. Uh, <laughs> one, one of the things that I did, and I have to give my mom a little credit on this one, because she's the one that sort of started me doing this uh, early on. She said, when you're on a date and you're 
and let's say you're meeting in a restaurant and your your date is going to their car and you're going to your car, always walk your date to the car, mm-hmm. even if they say no. And you do that because you say very vulnerably, I'm doing that because I want to make sure you get there okay. And I think that's so beautiful, but so many couples get to a point where they stop doing that kind of thing. Right. So when you're talking about sort of the hello goodbyes, that's really what you're talking about. That's really it. You know, even just taking that effort, like you're both laying down in bed and you just roll over and give each other a kiss, good night. You know, those types of moments, when we forget those moments, that's where, where the ugly stuff starts to build up. Right. The time that, and it's not about the whatever, the, it's really about acknowledging the importance and that I'm not going to go to bed until I give you a kiss goodbye because that's so important to me. Right. And letting someone know that. You know, one of the things that I, I talked about in one of my uh, blogs was rituals. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the rituals that, that we talked about was that, and, and also I did one that was tied into that on, you know, romancing. And what I said is, and I gave a suggestion to the guys. I said, you want to really get your wife to feel loved? Do what I'm about to tell you. And I said, when you leave for work, go to your car and then come back into the house and tell your wife or girlfriend or who, your partner that you can't leave before giving them another kiss. That's beautiful. And, it, and it's not about just sort of like manipulating, and it's not at all. It's really about saying you matter and our connection is the only thing that matters to me. It really is. And you know, it's such a wonderful thing, and, and you teach – this every day that you meet with couples, Rebecca, and I think you do such a wonderful job with it because that sensitivity that comes from who you are as a person really shines through. Mm, thanks, Stuart. And teaching that, I mean, I think that's the piece that's so hard with these couples is teaching them that there's value in this. Yeah. There, you know, there's so much value. I think also finding the ways for these couples to do them in ways that fit into their lives. So the rituals of connection, that's these little moments. These things are, are so integral, just like you've described, but they're also something that like we have to kind of like find the right prescription for every couple. Right. There's going to be the thing that this particular couple can do that's really easy. It might be like a pat on the butt every time they walk by each other. It might be a six-second kiss. It might be just sitting and looking at each other for a full minute. It might be being mindful of those of the way they say hello and goodbye. It could be a lot of different things, but it's whatever those particular things are to actually make sure that they're doing them. And I think the thing that we need to make sure we highlight is each person is going to have a different need or thing that's going to ring true for them of what it means to feel that someone has your back to sort of go full circle with all of this, whether we're talking sexuality or whether we're just talking about just being day-to-day life, that's going to change. And unless you can have that dialogue, unless right. you talk about that. Well, I think, and one of my upcoming posts, it's, it's not published yet, but one of the upcoming ones, the topic of it is on why foreplay is really something that happens all day long every day. It's not something that happens just before we, we hop into bed together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think these moments, these, these moments of knowing that your partner is there for you, that you can trust each other, that you can feel secure, this is the foreplay. This is the stuff that makes us desire each other. It's also sometimes the stuff that pushes us apart from each other. Not, <laughs> right. not exactly the, these little mindful moments, but just the kind of the everyday stuff is kind of sometimes what pushes us apart. But it's also where the foreplay lies. And then when you have those things that push you apart, particularly when there are parents and kids and, you know, th- places you have to bring the kids. and th- I'm just thinking you know? for a minute. <laughs> I'm thinking for a minute my husband and I have this ritual of kissing each other for six whole seconds. And we do it pretty often. We, we do a few times a day. And our kids are often, like, literally trying to sneak in between us. <laughs> right. Come on, Mom. The soccer is going to start. <laughs> and then if their friends are over, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Excuse us while we go in the bedroom and kiss for six seconds. <laughs> that works maybe with the kids your age. How old are your kids? 
four and six. Yeah, it won't work. Yeah, they're little. The older they're ones. Not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> but it's so, yeah. it's so true. It's so true. You know, and what I was just thinking is that if, again, this relationship is forever, if you make the sexuality or, or, you know, a particular sex act or a particular kind of sexual expression, the thing that matters the most, when you get to be 60, 70, or 80, and your body starts breaking down and things don't work so well, then what do you have if that's all that mattered? If that's all the only way you really show that love, you're not going to have the deeper thing, which is, you know, how exciting it is to just be sitting next to each other. You know, and I I tend to think about sexuality in a really broad way. I don't think about it just in terms of sex. Mm -hmm. I think about it also in terms of just kind of like how we embody ourselves, how we express ourselves, how we connect to other people and have relationship. And so I think all the time as parents, as, as a parenting couple, parents are constantly modeling what sexuality is to their children. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, I mean, like that's sexual education, right? Watching your parents like be a couple together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, to feel like you have parents that are connected and care and are nurturing and are there for one another and you see what that has created. Yeah. You just, you want that. How could you not want that in your life? So much so. And then on the other hand, there are lots of clients who come to me who haven't had that. Right. And they still want it. They just don't know what it looks like. And I think the biggest challenge for you has to be in those situations. How do you let people know who have never experienced that, that it is a real, a real thing that they can have? Well, I think that this is, it, it taps into people's intuition. Right. Right. Because on a, on just a kind of human level, we all have these drives to attach to others. So we know what that desire feels like, whether it was met or it wasn't met in our own childhoods. We know what it feels like to want to feel that attachment. We might not feel so secure and safe and having it yet, but we know what the want feels like. But the question always comes Mm -hmm. up is, is it realistic that I can actually have Mm -hmm. that or is this just pie in the sky? Right. I think that's the bigger challenge for you is because for you to be sitting down with these, this couple who has kids that's screaming all over the place and are, are unruly and they're doing the best that they can do and sometimes it's working and sometimes it's not, to say it really is worth it to just slow down and sit and have a cup of coffee with your partner and just enjoy each other's company and that's going to get you more than anything else. I think they can find the biggest retreats from everything that is chaotic in their lives when they find right. each other. Right. You know, I, I have clients who, who have come from really traumatic childhoods where each of them have. And perhaps the, the wife had a really bad case of postpartum depression. Maybe even the husband did, because we know that husbands can get that too. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, we and, can. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, they can be in great conflict with each other. They can really trigger each other and push each other's buttons, but they can also be the, the place where they find retreat. They can, it's in their relationship and in the connection they have with each other and in the tiniest moments of humor or they can just find something where when they find each other, it's like everything gets a little lighter. They're not carrying as much, and they're not carrying it by themselves. You can breathe when your partner's there. You that, can breathe. And, and you can't breathe when you're in the middle of a conflict with a kid. No. And, and I think that's, I mean, that's the power of this for me, is if I have someone in my life that I know is there, I can say, life's okay, no matter what. We have each other. We'll be here. Life will go on. And we're going to be two people in the world that love each other. And that's all that matters. If you really believe that, Mm -hmm. you can handle almost anything. You can. So we're we're about out of time. And one of the, I guess, the last question I have for you is, if you could sort of sum up in, you know, a couple of sentences or a couple of tips would even be better for my listeners of what suggestions or recommendations you would have to help 
families who are struggling with this connection, partly because the kids are just sort of taking so much energy, what would you suggest that they do today that would probably help them the most? (laughs) Find a moment in your day to take pause. It could be after the children go to sleep and sit down with your partner and ask them the kind of questions that you asked when you were dating. Get to know each other. Find out the things that you think you know, but maybe you don't know. There's, there's never a wrong question. There's never something that you should know or that you... There's always an opportunity to learn more. And it's in those moments where you, you find the time to sit down with one another and learn more that you take that pause and that you kind of devote your time to each other. Those are the moments that are everything because they give you more positive feelings about one another. And from that space, you're in a better position to manage future conflicts. And I think, uh, I think what you just suggested is so wonderful. And I think we do, though, have to highlight that if you make those efforts in a sincere, obvious way, because one of the questions people always ask me is, how do I know when we need some help? You know, <laughs> when you're thinking you do, you do. <laughs> well, usually, but if you do that from with good intention, and you don't get the kind of reaction that you think you should get, and your partner maybe feel it feels rejecting or whatever, and they they're not willing to have that kind of dialogue with you, I think that's all you need to know. Well. Thank you very much for coming on the Couples Expert podcast. I think that your insights, I think, are going to be really valuable. And I just want to really thank you for taking the time to really uh, devote your, your time today to really sharing your insights with my listeners. And I think everyone's going to benefit from it. So thanks again. Oh, thank you, Stuart. Thank All you right. Great. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to today's episode with your host, Stuart Fensterheim. You're one step closer to reigniting that fiery passion with your partner. For more information and your 30-minute free phone consultation with Stuart, visit www.thecouplesexpertscottsdale.com. We'll see you next time.